to say that people who are locked up become inhuman, their actions have been inhuman. And for them to be locked up, they're, they're just, there's, what, what other way can you do it? These people that use their weapons now should get far more severe sentences. And get them all the hard labour it's going. The best thing can do really is to bring back conscription. It will not only solve the problem of unemployment, but it'll get all the young terriers off the streets. As far as I'm concerned, you pass legislation one man to a cell. They're getting their bed and breakfast for nothing. I've no personal first-hand knowledge of prisons, but I presume there's a need for a sort of deterrent, but they don't seem to be altogether satisfactory insofar as it seems to be almost a revolving door. When prisoners are received from police custody, they are classified by age and previous conviction. Untried to the left, convicted to the right. Give me a full name and sentence. John Brown, four months, sir. After documentation, he is placed behind this screen where he strips off and hands over his personal belongings. He is then taken for a shower. After the prisoner has a shower, he is medically examined and put to the resident hall of his classification. you've been allocated, you'll be required to keep it clean and tidy at all times. There's a rule book furnished for your assistance. Any more problems, contact me. Arlini, Scotland's largest prison. Its governor, Mr Mackenzie. Mr Mackenzie, why in this day of our so-called enlightened society do we still need establishments like Bellini? Because people are bad. And uh, they're required to be in prison. And that's basically it. It's as simple as that. Yes. The attitude of society to prisons is um, changing very much. Do you tend to reflect these uh, changes and attitudes, or do you tend to react against them? Not at all. Not at all. It is entirely necessary that we keep pace with modern society. Other institutions change, and uh, so does prison. Yes. And uh, I should hope change for the better. From what I've seen, Mr. Mackenzie, you run a tight, well-disciplined prison. Do you have to brook any interference from outside agencies? Not really. Uh, I have no interference from any department as far as the day-to-day -day management of the prison is concerned. Of course, it's got to be borne in mind that I've got to run the prison in accordance with prison rules as laid down by Parliament. Yes, I see. But the vast majority of the ordinary people that we spoke to before coming here said that they'd like to see harsher measures taken in prison. Would you agree with this? No, not at all. Um, you'll never get anywhere by harsh measures in prison. What one has to do is to have a well-balanced institution whereby men are given the opportunity to think for themselves, give them as much training as we possibly can. And the harshness is, of course, when a man is sent to prison and gives up his freedom and liberty. People outside have the impression that all prisoners do is sit around all day sewing mailbags. Is this the case? 
Not at all. Uh, a section of the prison do. And we've got to bear in mind that uh, a proportion of men coming into prison hasn't got the intelligence to carry out a full-skill job such as engineering and so on. Yes. And these um, are the men who do the mailbags? Yes, so yes. We are very anxious to improve and uh, increase our, our industrial side of prison life. Behind me is the industrial complex of Berlini Prison, for which I am responsible as manager. My functions are as general manager of all the various aspects of production, planning, training of all the prisoners in Berlini Prison. We have a number of workshops spanning the general aspect of industry outside, from concrete, joinery, textiles, etc. The total value of expenditure on materials and articles produced in this prison run in the region of almost a million, million pound per year. Number five shed, industrial officer Jay McNellis. There are 200 prisoners in this party, which is known as an allocation party. Every prisoner is allocated from this party to other parties where they are best suited. They are also fingerprinted in this party before being dispatched to their other parties. In this party consists of repairing mill bags for the GPO and also for sewing on handles onto new mill bags which are called tabs and from then they are then dispatched from this party to the various warehouses. The type of prisoner kept in the allocation party for all of their sentences are uh, the dropouts from society, alcoholics, uh, epileptics, sex offenders and also the type of prisoner that's doing, say, two pound or five days, it can't afford to pay a two pound fine. Well, this is a, a prison for a allocation prison, you see. And uh, my opinion is this, that uh, they don't seem to, uh, I was, what I would say, they don't seem to um, care for you more than any other, what they do in any other prison. But that, that being this allocation prison, yeah. That's, that's the reason being. I suppose uh, when I was in Peterhead, well, they do go to the road for it to help you in every way and try to make, 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 make your time much easier for you. Well, the staff and the, the governors up there yeah. do. Uh, and this you feel, feel a man really gets punished when he comes to Berlin? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Aye. Oh, yes. Aye. He knows you're doing time when he doesn't have any prison. <laughs> this is a joinery section where all types of furniture are made, roof trusses, etc., and all sorts of prison uh, furniture, tables, chairs, furniture for prison officers, and a variety of stuff for the prison department, play groups, etc. We, we have a problem with security, and all the tools are checked twice a day on boards with shadow boards, and each one is placed on the shadow so it's obvious if a tool is missing. What did you think of the, the um, prison officers and so on as you arrived? I mean, did you feel you were in for a hard time or what? I thought I'd have been in for a hard time right enough. So I didn't know what prisons were like, really. Yeah. Just going by what I'd heard outside about prisons. I thought they were terrible places to be in. Is it a terrible place to be in? Oh, well, I wouldn't like to come back again. Did you have a trade when you were outside? Yes. You had? What were you? Student nurse. Employ about 80 prisoners a year, making mats. The types we have are more or less a set of this, between 21 and 30. It's all government contracts, and they turn out roughly 250 mats per week. You've nothing in here, this is just like a big, a big model. It's just, just a place to put you. Uh, if you're doing a big sentence, you get transferred to another prison, right? Well, they don't cater for anybody here. I mean, they've got you locked up all weekend, whereas in other prisons they haven't. I think they should give you more, uh, let you out your cell more. I mean, I've heard, at the weekend in the hall I'm in, I've heard men cracking up. 
heard them slashing their wrists through, been locked up for four o'clock on a Saturday night, right to the next morning, by the way. And it's the same on a Sunday. You know, the, some of them try to hang yourself, and others just scream and batter their heads off the wall. I don't know how those people outside the wall don't hear us. There's one thing you'll never get in jail, sympathy. I'm afraid that's out. A laundry employs about 40 men, serving a population of about 2,000 prisoners. The output is around two and a half tons of dry washing per day, 35,000 items per week. The inmates get a change of clothing about once a week. Mr. Black, officer in charge of Textiles Party. We are, at the moment, we are in the process of manufacturing mail bags, kit bags for the army, kit bags for the navy, cook's hats for the army, and uh, various postal work. We have very, very few discipline problems in this party because we are the main production party in Berlin Prison. I should know by then, when I'm 26 years of age, what I'm doing, but as I said, I was drunk and had a fight with a fella, and that was it, you know. About 12 months, it was a, entirely my own fault as far as I'm concerned, you know. And this time, drunk again, singing, go down the street, jail, breach of the peace, three months. Mm -hmm. I thought it was unfair at the time, you know. But uh, the police said I was trying to fight, and uh, no, they kind of mm -hmm. put their story, mm -hmm. mix mm -hmm. it a wee bit, mm -hmm. and uh, that's it. Mm -hmm. Well, my wife definitely didn't like it. Look, look at that way, you know. And I think I just went my last legs if I don't know what I'm doing. At 11.45 a.m. each day, the officers line the route from the work area to the dining hall. Then, shed by shed, the 1,500 men are called to lunch. Right. number three, send one. Right. What do you think of the food in my life? It's not much caught. I saw some of the food today, and to me it looked good. And I think I had basically what um, the prisoners had. And I didn't think it was a bad meal at all. You're not eating that every day, but... A lot of the stuff that's served up here I don't eat outside. Oh, I'll, I'll give the cookies due, the, the chief cookie. This is his best. He puts on some nice wee dishes at times there. And you can tell what you're going to get every day. Mr. Williams, how important is diet to a prison? Uh, if the food is good and the variety is good, the jail and the prison run smoothly. Yes. Do you do any special diets, sir? Uh, diabetics, uh, vegetarians, uh, milk diets and so forth. I see. Ask the medical officer advice. Is food considered part of a punishment element for prisoners? Well, for the past 14 years, uh, I don't remember a, a punishment diet of any sort. After lunch, the inmates are taken to the yard for one hour's exercise. Then it's back to work till 4 p.m. Harleney Prison was built during the years 1880 to 1886. Although the cell blocks remain essentially the same today as when originally erected, many alterations and improvements have been made over the years. Sometimes this marks a change of emphasis in the treatment of inmates. The hospital is a case in point. Dr. Anderson, Chief Medical Officer. How do you assess the general level of fitness of prisoners coming into the prison? Well, on admission, fear. Now you have a hospital here. What facilities and staff do you have? The total staff of the surgery is uh, 24, but we're understaffed at the moment. We have only 20. Yeah. Uh, we have um, 14 beds in the sick ward and 16 in the psychiatric ward. Do yes. you see anything from 60 to 80 uh, patients a day? How effective can you be in this case? Uh, I think with the prisoners who are really ill, we, we can be very effective. But with the ordinary run, um, 
the ordinary run of prisoners require very little treatment. In yes. Any. What special facilities do you have for psychiatric treatment? Well, we have the for uh, ob purposes of observation, and we also have um, visiting psychiatrists who can uh, assist us in the management of prisoners. Yes, but you can't carry out any uh, psychiatric treatment as such? Only in a minor way. In Anything minor major way. would require to go to an outside yes. hospital. Do you ever conduct any controlled physical tests and measurements on, for your own information? We haven't, no. No? None at all? No. Okay, fine, thank you. In this ward, we can handle most medical and minor surgical cases. Any major surgical case is normally transferred to the nearest local hospital. Uh, a prisoner who becomes mentally disturbed uh, can be transferred under the Mental Health Act to a mental hospital where he will receive the appropriate treatment. We have a small pantry here where meals are prepared, served, bathroom, toilet, um, records office far upstairs, and five medical cells. On the other side of the gate, we have the untried ward and the observation ward. This is kept for uh, prisoners who are waiting reports from the pocket at fiscal. We have two strong cells here for patients who uh, could be violent or suicidal. Yes. Uh, they are kept here under strict observation. Some of these patients can be quite disturbed and violent. We have two of these cells. Uh, the word is observed from here by Mr. Coffey. Checking like 10 on try, 12 off the XR. What do your duties consist of here, Mr. Coffey? My duties consist of general observation of the patients in the day room and making daily reports on their general behavior. Yeah. Mr. Tate, do you think that prison is a suitable place for cases of mental illness or mental subnormality? Well, if a man is neurotic, he just has to be contained here. If he's psychotic, he will be certified and sent to a proper mental hospital. But you do have convicted prisoners here who are mentally subnormal. We do have, yes. yes. Thank yes. you, Mr. Day. Mr. McDonald, prison security has largely stamped out the instance of weapons like these among prisoners. Um, what percentage of these actual weapons have been used in crimes? In oh, approximately 1%. Approximately 1%. Yes. Is this on prison officers or other prisoners? No, uh, mainly on other prisoners. Yes. A very few assaults take place. Why points. does a prisoner feel it necessary to arm him with himself with a thing like this? More for his defence uh, against others than attack. Yes. Yet there still are breaches of discipline. How are these dealt with? These are dealt with by the governor uh, who holds an orderly room in the prison every morning at approximately 10.30. Asher, quick march. Give your full name and send Mr. James Asher, four months, sir. Asher, you are here charged with offending against good order and discipline. That is, destroying prison property. A library book and the evidence against you is by James McMahon. Evidence, please. Governor, sir, while searching this inmate's cell on the third flat B hall, at approximately 10.30, I found a prison library book with the pages torn out. On questioning the inmate, he denied the charge. I had no alternative but place the inmate on your report, sir. You have the evidence, uh, Asher. Have you got anything to say on your own behalf? It was accidental, sir, and there were two or three pages loose. I didn't think it was well reporting to the officer, sir. Was the writing at the back of the book also accidental? The writing was on there, sir. You mean before the book was handed to you? Yes, sir. Well, books are expensive, and we have to pay for them, and uh, you will have to pay for this book, which will cost you uh, the minimum of five shillings and you are also severely reprimanded. The come, please march. Oh. 
I go to church every Sunday. I'm in the choir and everything. We're in the choir. Commandments, etc. No, it is for rich men. It is for their protection. That's as far as I'm concerned. You do a sin, you say, well, suppose you, you pray to God, say, well, I hope I never come back. Who appoints you, Mr. Johnson? I'm appointed by the Scot Scottish Home and Health Department on the recommendation of the Home Board of the Church of Scotland. Yes. And you follow? Well, I am recommended by the Archbishop of Glasgow. Yes, on the same... On the same basis. Yes, yes. I see. Um, do you work office hours? Well, I have two colleagues. There are three Church of Scotland ministers here, so we're here most every morning, really, during the week and other times as required. Yes. Mm. Well, I'm on my own here, but I have no parochial commitments at all. So you're totally I'm committed totally to the prison? To the prison. Yes. Um, can a prisoner come to you in complete confidence? He can, yes, always. This is one of the things that's understood in the situation here and can talk quite freely. Yes. And he sees you privately? He sees, sees us privately. There is never anyone else present, unless he wishes someone else to be present, but in most cases, yes. no. Yes. If he does, of course, have a problem in which he needs further guidance, we try to give this to him and recommend how he can get help. And sometimes, yes. when he asks it, we pass it on to other agencies in the prison or outside. Yes, so you can act as a link with we the do. outside Yes, part. this is a very yes. important part of our work, yes. I think. How would you help a prisoner who is really overcome with loneliness? Well, I think what, what would happen is that, first of all, he's looking for a shoulder to cry on, yes. mainly someone to talk to, and after all, I mean, we are trained listeners, and uh, the mere fact that you listen to his troubles certainly eases it for him. And in complete confidence. In complete confidence, we find that just being there and letting a man talk and work through his problems of readjustment, especially if this is his first time in prison, is again part of our job yes. which we hope is, is useful and we find that after a few days a man does work through this awful loneliness of the beginning yes. and it becomes adjusted to yes. it. How effective can you be in your ministry, Father? Well, it's difficult to measure this. Uh, for the most part, uh, the ones that who are coming back, I suppose you would call them our failures, the ones who don't come back, we're not even sure that they're not in trouble elsewhere because they could be in some other yes. prison. Yes. Do you find the same thing, Mr. Johnson? Yes, it's always very difficult. I think in the ministry generally it's very difficult to measure success in any kind of ordinary terms. We just say that we do our, our best. We're very happy to be representatives of the church in this very limited sphere. Yes. And occasionally we do find the, the odd case where men will come and feel that they have been helped while they've been in prison. But in most cases we carry on, hopefully, as it were. Yes. Do you find this a very different ministry from outside? Well, I wouldn't think so. I mean, after all, the, the troubles which you, you're coming across here, domestic problems, the difficulty with their wives, with paying rent and so on, I wouldn't get exactly the same outside. I mean, people would come to me outside for help with domestic problems, yes. just the same way as they yes. come here. The difference, of course, is that the man is not able to do anything himself, whereas outside he can. Yes, indeed. Yes, yes I agree with this wholeheartedly. This yes. is a position that little problems which a man can easily cope with in the outside world, of course, he's unable to do so yes. while he's here. So we help in some kind of measure as a link, an advisory yes. service. Fine. Thank you very much indeed. Good evening. This, as you will see, is our recreation room in the prison and all prisoners who are serving sentences of six months and more are eligible for recreation. They must serve two months prior to uh, being accorded the privilege of recreation, uh, but thereafter they have approximately seven hours of recreation per week.
some may say, what good does recreation do? Well, of course, if a man is serving a prison sentence and he works during the day, it's only fair and reasonable, reasonable to expect him to have some form of recreation in the evenings. Furthermore, when numbers are small in a recreation room, it is an important aspect of an officer's job to indulge in a game of billiards or a game of table tennis or a game of cards and try to get to know the prisoner a wee bit better. This may help to solve some of his problems and it promotes a much better relationship between staff and prisoners. Mr. Mackenzie, are there any circumstances under which you would seek permission to pardon a convicted prisoner? Yes. Uh, if a prisoner went to the assistance of a member of the staff being attacked, or if he took steps to prevent property being destroyed, or anything in that nature, I'd be very willing to put forward a case of our claim on his behalf. Yes. Is there any way that you can improve public relations? Yes. Doing what you're doing. Coming in here and seeing for yourselves what the prison is like and taking it out to the public for themselves to see and judge. Yes. After 30 years in the prison service, what do you see for the future, sir? I see a very exciting time ahead. There's a tremendous lot to be done to improve conditions, uh, all round chronology. And I should hope that with science and various aids coming forward, that one day prisons would be empty. Sarah is 36 years old with a two-year-old daughter Susie. She was born to a professional family in England, went to Australia when she was nine and returned to Britain at the age of 20 to train as a doctor at St Thomas's Hospital in London. She then moved to Scotland to study psychiatry but that training was broken off in early 1980 when Sarah married and later moved to Edinburgh. Today she and her husband have established a centre there concentrating on prisons, drugs and mental health. All round then an interesting life but nothing too remarkable except that Sarah's husband is Jimmy Boyle still most widely known as a convicted murderer, ultimate Glasgow hard man and controversial special unit sculptor. I mean, I wasn't looking for someone to fall in love with. <laughs> I mean, uh, Jimmy, first thing is it was smaller than I was expecting. Um, it was very lively, very, it spoke very quickly, a lot of energy. And what I can remember of the meeting, um, two things impressed me. One was him and the sort of, I suppose, scope of his knowledge and experience, which is way beyond just the sort of narrow confines of the, the prison and indeed Glasgow that he came from. Um, the other thing was a special unit. I'd visited prisons before, but it was completely different from your normal experience from a, a prison. I had, in fact, been interested in prisons before meeting him, um, but our interests went beyond that. I suppose an interest as well in social conditions and the way that that affects people. So it was a working interest as much as it was, you know, a relationship, a rapport between the two of us, which really we hit it off, we got on well, and, you know, the feeling developed from that. I, in fact, wasn't in Scotland at the time when his um, court cases were hitting the headlines. Uh, so in a sense, I was judging Jim Jeremy from point of view of having read his book and meeting him much later on. Um, he was, uh, as he says, a controversial character at that time. 
And I think it wasn't somebody I would have chosen to sort of form a relationship with, but it just so happened it happened. And initially, obviously, it was quite a private thing between the two of us because of people's reactions to it. And I think we had to sort of ground ourselves in that um, so that we were ready to meet the pressures later on. I think we just want to experience this very important (laughs) point in our life. Please, gentlemen. Why did you decide to get married? Well... I mean, it's a difficult answer. Why does anybody decide to get married? It's obviously, first and foremost, recognising what we felt for each other. It was a commitment which we felt we wanted to make, uh, which is saying it's not just for now, but it's for the future as well. At that point, recognised there's still quite a lot to come through before he was released. Uh, and I think we made the decision from the point of view of strengthening our position together. <laughs> The wedding was quite a, an exceptional day. For me, it was a very special day, despite the, the pressures and the difficulties of the situation. Uh, it was obviously made much more difficult for us because of all the media interest. That's something we went to great lengths to try and avoid. And we were allowed out of the prison for the wedding ceremony, so we, we stick to a small out-of-the-way village called Balfron. Um, but the press caught on to it about three days beforehand, and then the big chase was on. Um, but we made our own sort of special ritual, um, which is just very much between us. And that part of the day was something which wasn't intruded on at all, and that's what I remember. Well, we're overjoyed, but at the same time, there's lots of difficulties, you know, because hard day, hard year, months ahead. My family were always very good, and both my parents supported the marriage, and they met Jeremy and they liked him and said, he's the right person for you. And as far as they were concerned, it was as simple as that. Obviously, people judging it further removed, you know, found it more difficult to understand. And it's only really perhaps now when they can see us out, it's working. We've got Susie and we've got the gateway. And that they can say, well, maybe, you know, there was more in it than we thought at first. I think we decided that once um, the leak had occurred, there was no way of us getting married without a splash of publicity. Both of us had had some emotional build up to getting married. Obviously, you're making a big thing of it, it is a big thing. And that being the case, we decided it was better to go ahead um, than to postpone it. Work in the future, any particular plans you have to make it a successful marriage in the long term? It will be a successful marriage, I'd say that. Um, you're obviously certain about that. Absolutely. But how much have you thought about it in planning this? Well, people don't get married without thinking a lot about areas like that. There was one thing your husband said as he left the registry office, and that is that the next month is going to be a particularly tough one to face. Have you any idea what he meant when he said that? I didn't hear him make that comment. I think um, perhaps the situation to me it ha- is hardest at this time with all this abnormal publicity and exposure um, at a time when it's a tremendous personal step. When he does finally leave prison, how do, how do you plan to help him adjust to life outside once again? Well, I think both of us can give each other a lot of support. Um, it'll be a matter of seeing what happens. We've been through a lot of difficult times together anyway. Um, and it's just a process which follows through. Responsible for helping him readjust to outside life, or has My he goodness, that I mean, Jimmy's been through enough of it in his own already, not to be dependent on me in that respect. Um, it will be a mutual process. In the future or um, I think, obviously, again, that's difficult to say because it's all in the future. The plans are up in the air before we know the parole prospects.
wonderful. Do you know, sure if bloody want to use them. But when they get out, they're not going to go to quiet back. Paul's worked very hard, and I think perhaps a lot of people don't appreciate that. He's... What do you today think of the man that you were 15 years ago? I think that it's a terrible waste of a human being and the potential that he has. You know, I'm just sad that it had to be... I had to come through everything in order to be where I am today. But maybe that's something that I had to come through in order for other people to learn from it. And the fact that I'm able to articulate some of the experience, I'm able to speak about it, or give people a better understanding. Because what I believe is that through that knowledge and through that experience that we can all learn from it. and being allowed this uh, opportunity to go into see the special unit of Berlin A, which gave me skills for coming out. The problem, but, uh, the difference between me and the other guys coming out is that they've not had them. They've been, had all responsibility taken away from them. And, and in some respects come out social cripples. And I'm saying that without meaning to demean people, but that's really what happens. You know, they come out lacking social skills and lacking confidence. And I think that we in the Gateway can do is we can understand that and we can sort of just share our skills and our sort of um, experience with them. And it's a two-way process, but I think, first of all, we can give them acceptance. Well, I think in some respects it's gone beyond the sort of wildest expectations, you know, particularly the part which connects to the country as a whole, you know, throughout Britain, that we're doing work in all these other areas, which to me is... Um, very important, very exciting, but something that we hadn't envisaged in those days. On the other hand, the Gateway is just a baby. You know, it's only two years old. It's just learning to grow and develop, you know. So, yeah, in some respects, yes, but in others, far beyond what we expected. People are now willing to accept you for the work you're doing rather than dwelling on your past. Well, I think in Scotland, you know, I'm looked in as a controversial figure, you know, I don't know why, but um, the, that's a joke. But the, um, the other part is that um, so Scotland as a society is, is torn in two, is split in two. When I go to the areas that I come from, I get quite a lot of acceptance. People are inviting me to come to their community to help support them. And they're the people I care about, to be honest with you. The other groups, and they largely make up the sort of professional intelligentsia, I couldn't, I couldn't care less about them. They've never really connected to our world. They don't really care. So my main concern is what the people where I come from, what my experience, and, it, and that's what's marvellous for me. The other side of your life that's obviously been developing over the last four years is your family life. How do you enjoy family life? It's um, hard work. <laughs> Su Susie's got tremendous energy and Sarah and I are at times exhausted, but, but we're very happy. You see, the interesting thing is when we get married, lots of people were, oh God, how can that marriage happen in the, in, to people in, in, in a prison? I mean, look at us now, we're really happy. You know, we've got a daughter, we're really involved in the, the work that we're doing, committed to it, and living a life that which we're happy with. And if the, the result of that is that lovely child, Susie, who makes us their life worthwhile, then that's marvellous. What are people are moaning about? You know, I mean, what was it all about? It was a load of rubbish. After 15 years, like, there's no bitterness. You know, I've managed to develop myself beyond that. And, you know, that's something I'm quite proud of. How do you feel about becoming a celebrity, the prisoner of celebrity? It's a new <laughs> phenomenon. Parts of prison. I certainly support um, what the special unit has done, which has been a magnificent um, innovation in um, penal reform, and the prison staff there have been absolutely wonderful. Jimmy Boyle's last major spell at Peterhead Prison was at Her Majesty's pleasure and not at the special invitation of the Governor. That followed an article in a national newspaper in which Mr Boyle described the jail in which he served part of his 15-year sentence as a hate factory. Prison bosses were keen to set the record straight about the reforms and improvements which they feel have earned Peter Head a better reputation. If, if we believe that we do good in the prison service, then we must accept that sometimes people will be improved and, and, and will in fact go out better people. 
in which case I think we should be pleased about that and we should welcome them back and we should listen to what they've got to say about their experiences in prison. But it's clear time doesn't heal all wounds. Only 30 officers attended today's meeting, the rest said to be boycotting. The Scottish Prison Officers Association say they don't wish to be associated with anyone who seeks to denigrate their work. Jimmy Boyle says the objectors have allowed themselves to become prisoner to his past, but he says the term hate factory still applies. There is no doubt that Peter Head has been one of the most sort of violent prisons in the Scottish penal system, and there is equally no doubt that Peter Head, in line with the Scottish prison system, is trying to do something which I believe to be imaginative, to be bold, and to be revolutionary in a sense in providing a positive and constructive service for the community outside and that's got to be encouraged. The end of what Jimmy Boyle described as a draining and traumatic return to Peterhead also signalled the end of a personal era. After 10 years as a free man he's decided to sever his ties with the past and prison reform. At first sight, it's far from what you'd expect, bearing in mind that its seven inmates are some of Scotland's most notorious criminals. Five of them are serving life sentences. In the past, some of them were so troublesome they had to be locked up in solitary confinement. But here, things couldn't be more different. They wear their own clothes, do their own cooking, and involve themselves in a wide range of recreational activities. Visiting is virtually unrestricted. Guests can be entertained in their cells until the prisoners are locked up at night. And the decor is their own. They're allowed to have the accoutrements of modern living, so long as the prisoners themselves can provide them. With the prison officers, they're on first-name terms. And all in all, it can appear at times as more of a social club than a prison. When an officer first arrives here, he can hardly believe his eyes. And that goes too for the prisoners. Well, the tensions are, are inbuilt things. Um, naturally, in a place like this, with the type of inmates we have, uh, and we are, in fact, their custodians, although we appear just to be another member of this community, um, there's tension created due to confrontation. Uh, prisoners have frustrations because they are locked up. We we'll lock them up at night. Um, they have frustrations. They show this in, sometimes in their anger, getting out their aggression and we can, we can be confronted. In the normal prison system, if I tell a prisoner to do something, the prisoner's got to do that, and if he doesn't do it, he's locked up. In, in a year, if I tell a prisoner, ask a prisoner to do something, and a prisoner doesn't do it, then I can call a meeting. The community decides whether I was right or wrong. I've got to come to terms with that, because in another prison, I'm the boss with the prisoner. This can create problems because you see your authority being questioned in front of everyone else. This takes time. Some staff find it very difficult. I've not always found it easy. You now come to terms with it and accept it. All the inmates agree that they're better away from the mainstream prison system. Here they can rid themselves of the habits of the hard man which traditional prisons exacerbate. Ironically, most of them will go back into the mainstream system before ultimately being released. They're opposed to that, but why is it necessary? There is nothing to say that a prisoner could not be released from the special unit. Each prisoner is considered uh, as, a, as a separate case, as an individual case, and if the need arose for him to be released from a unit, then that would be possible. Uh, the norm at present time is to move on to a semi-open and open prison prior to release and training for freedom. It may seem that these prisoners are being mollycoddled, but both inmates and officers would argue it's not quite the soft option it appears to be. When the claustrophobic atmosphere of the unit is at its most intense, it must seem that the black and white world of a traditional prison is the softer option. As far as I was concerned, I was treated like a human being for the first time in my life in institutions. And I think it's only then that you start to think, you say, this, this place is real. Out of the years that I have been locked up, in this particular sentence, I found that I became more bitter towards society, everybody in general. And I'm only grateful to everybody concerned that I got the opportunity to come into the unit. And so far, I feel that I've had a lot of satisfaction in being able to prove myself. I'm not saying that tomorrow I think they should all, they're all fit for the street. 
But what I'm saying is they're giving some response. As long as they can continue to give this response, then I can see the luxuries that people can perhaps criticise that they're afforded, I can see it as being worth it. What the special unit offers prisoners is hope. Had they remained in the mainstream prison and continued with the behavioural pattern that they had displayed in the past, the truth of the matter is that most of the prisoners here who are serving indeterminate sentences would never again be released. When they come to the unit, they have a new hope, a new belief in themselves, and they feel that having been in the unit, that they, when the eventual release comes, they will be better equipped but to deal with life in society. be any prison anywhere. Existence is one long, tedious, unchanging routine. Every act is in response to a shout of command, and life is as drab and grey as the uniforms. But only a few yards away is a different prison within a prison. Beyond the heavy green door marked special unit are some very special prisoners. The five men kept inside this high security unit are all convicted killers. Since they were brought from various other prisons to this unit, violence in the Scottish prison system has fallen dramatically. In this yard, the casual way in which the inmates and the staff mix is the essence of a unique experiment in the world's penal systems. These are men normal prisons found to be dangerous or disruptive. There seemed no way of coping with them, a problem worsened by the fact that they could be detained for years, if not the rest of their lives. Each prisoner has a set work program which he can do as and when he pleases. They wear their own clothes and visitors are allowed almost any time. There's no segregation of staff and inmates and they call each other by their first names. Well, my personal opinion is that the CIA done it. One concession to normal prison procedure, however, is that they're locked in separate cells overnight. Cells which can be made much more homely than in a normal prison. They call them rooms. Security is strict with a higher ratio of staff to inmates than in other prisons and everyone has a responsibility for the running of the experiment. Although the special unit is within the walls of Berlini prison, it is self-contained and completely cut off. Governor Gordon Jackson is in charge of not only one of the most remarkable prisons, but possibly the smallest in the world. The governor, the staff and the prisoners make decisions at regular weekly meetings. All have their say on things like outside visits and which new prisoners might join the unit. The overriding aim is simply to sustain a workable community. I'd like to move into his metal and his sculpture. I was wondering how, if I could have access to, you know, scrap metal and um, materials for working with scrap metal. You know, this is a step forward from the straightforward sculpture he's been doing before and he wants to go into this sort of media. I don't see that we have any right to say no. Uh, I think he's proved himself already in the type of sculpture he's doing and the benefits he's getting from it, not just for what he's producing, but what uh, it does for him. And I would be only too happy to see him go try another media. Get me to meet people. This is Rad, convicted of stabbing a youth to death. At the time of the offence, he was 16. For this, he spent the last 14 years, almost half of his life, inside prison. I've been in just over 10 years. I'm in for manslaughter. And I've uh, been in about half a dozen prisons in England and Scotland. You've also uh, been accused and found guilty of several attacks on officers in various prisons. 1965 attempted murder of a prison officer. 1968 attempted murder of three prison officers and uh, common assaults and another two. 1972 uh, serious assaults and four prison officers. Mm. And there have been little incidents in between, you know, common assaults and things. So altogether you're doing a life sentence plus 26 years for the various assaults? Yes. Mm. How does this prospect hit you? Well, it's it deflated me somewhat, you know. But I just live from day to day. 
I don't I get up every day, you know, and sit down and say, all oh, gloomily that I'm doing life in 26 years, you know, and I won't be out for another 20 years. Does the thought ever strike you that you might never, ever be out at all? Oh, yes. That's, that's quite... That's quite a strong probability, you know. It's on the cards. I was sent to prison 1968 for murder at Edinburgh High Court. I killed my ex fiance um, It happened down near Shire, West Kilbride. I was in a suicide pact with her, but I didn't uh, keep it. What was your reaction in when you were sentenced to, to, to life imprisonment? Did you...? When I was sentenced to life, I was relieved to get sentenced. But then I was sent to Peterhead Prison. I started to rear up and smash up because I couldn't do my time. And then they sent me to Perth Prison where I'd done the very same. I was always getting put in Rule 36. Ended up by slashing a person in the jail. OK. Of course I was tried for, for um, three murders. But what, what the hell is this? People have to go with, with um, the law. If they go with the law, then I was found guilty of one murder. And by Christ, I'm paying for it. But I'll tell you this, I'm also paying for two other murders that I was completely um, freed on. I was found guilty of murder. What had you done? What you were supposed to have done? I was supposed to have uh, stabbed a man to death. How were those men chosen for the unit? I think they tended to choose themselves. There were those who had a record of serious violence within the prison. Those whose mental makeup, the type of offence they had committed and the danger they presented to the public suggested that they weren't making any progress through their life sentence and were unlikely to do so. So these are the types of men whom we have brought together in the special unit. Alex Stephen, former controller of Scottish prisons, was on the working party responsible for starting the unit. There were many reasons why something new was needed in the prison system. Old buildings and old attitudes were only part of the problem. Prison staff were becoming extremely concerned at the number of serious assaults on the men who had to patrol the crowded cell blocks. One measure used to try and stamp out the violence was a segregation unit at Porterfield Prison, Inverness. Troublemakers were sent there for a sharp disciplinary lesson. But since a riot which ended with four prisoners being charged with the attempted murder of six officers, the Porterfield unit has never been used. A new approach was obviously needed. So they removed five prisoners who were then seen as the most dangerous and troublesome men in the system and put them together in the special unit. There was also the point that the abolition of capital punishment presented us with a new problem. The Scottish Prison Service had never had to contain someone literally for the rest of his life. But with the abolition of capital punishment, I had to look forward to being able to do that. Quite naturally, the Scottish Prisoners or Prison Officers Association were concerned. They felt, particularly where a lifer was concerned, that he could murder again within the prison setting and appear to get no additional sentence. So in conjunction with the Prison Officers Association, we set up a working party to study how best we could deal with the violent prisoner and also how we could determine how best to treat the man who was going to be in prison for the rest of his life. And of course, sometimes these two categories overlapped or coincided. I mean, we were in and people kept telling us we were in for life, we'd never get out. So what the hell do you do? That, that, People were using that as an excuse in order for to treat you just like an animal. You know, so if they're going to treat you like an animal, you have no hope, you have no future. By Christ, I'm going to react like an animal. Because there was no other... You couldn't turn the other cheek, you couldn't just sit down and accept, because I have to live with myself. I've had the worst of Peterhead. I've had the worst of Inverness. I've been in solitary confinement for four and a half years. I've been taken to hospital twice after incidents with prison guards. Brutality won't affect me, it won't change my pattern of living. The, the system here will. In what way? <laughs> or how will it change you? Well, if people will approach me in a reasonable manner, then I will react in a reasonable manner. But if people approach me in a, a very aggressive and physical sort of way, I'll respond in that way. What, what effect 
this prison have on someone like yourself? Well, uh, the degrading aspects come immediately, as soon as you're in. You know, you're stripped naked in front of people. You're, you're made to take a bath as if you were filthy. The bath's only got about four inches of water in it anyway. And then you're given a uniform that doesn't fit you. And you're, you're, you're made to, to work at stupid things like sewing mailbags. You know? And if you talk, they shout at you in a very aggressive fashion. And there's an accumulation of petty things like that that goes on and on and on. And worst of all, are the prison officers who seem, seem to get really jumped up like Nazis, you know, because they've got this black uniform on. They strut about, you know, and they really think there's, there's something great about being a prison officer. Do you not think, though, that prison officers, in fairness to them, might treat you slightly differently than other prisoners because of your past record? That could be true after I had started assaulting them. But they, they treated me this way before I assaulted them. I mean, I was in uh, over a year before I seriously assaulted a prison officer. And uh, by the time I had reached the decision to attack a prison officer, I was nearly going mad. Can you do my time? Before that, I had done wee sentences. Nine months was my highest. But when I got life, I thought I would never get out, never see freedom. So I started rearing up, doing a lot of daft things. What sort of things did you do, for instance? My first bit of trouble was in the tailor's shop, Peter Head. I lifted one of the sewing machines and flung it through one of the windows. But it was an armor-plated window. The sewing machine just bounced back and hurt me. For that, I got locked up for 14 days all round and that was the start of my troubles. Once I was in the cells, I began to like it. Ever since then, I kept on getting into trouble to get put into the cells, get peace and quiet. Well, you're 22 year old, and you're told when you come in, if you behave yourself, you can get out in 10 years. And when you're 22 year old, this is, it's hard to visualize 10 years ahead in prison, you know? So I think I really give up hope at the beginning, you know? I was really shattered, I really give up hope, and I wasn't really, worried about freedom. You know, I thought I'd been unjustly done, so I wasn't aiming to get out. I didn't really care about getting out when I first got done here. And this, uh, I think, was the reason why I got into so much trouble. And later when I changed, the, the officers didn't accept that I had changed, you know. They thought I was the terrible person I was to begin with. And this, I feel, caused all my trouble, you know. The prison officer traditionally is a figure of authority. He sees in the special unit that the staff there no longer rely on the authoritarian approach. Therefore, he may feel that the example of the special unit could erode his position in the normal prison setting. I think what they're failing to understand is that a unit like the special unit can only be run on the basis of small numbers. You couldn't do it on the basis of, say, a large local prison like Barlini. Some prisoners do feel that the worse you behave, in fact, the worse you are, the better you're treated by being sent into the unit. I don't think this is so, and if the prisoners did feel this, I think would have very many applications to come into the unit. As a matter of fact, we've had only one application to come into the unit since it opened. I think many more of the prisoners see a grave danger in being transferred into the unit because they still have in their minds that it could be a stepping stone to the state mental hospital. Duty, my past experiences in prison, you know, I was very apprehensive as to what the unit was all about because anything I'd heard about it would come from prison officials, you know. That was the prison officials that came for the unit in order to interview me. And I felt, uh, I felt it was a stepping stone for Kirsters to certify me insane for Kirsters. You know, that was my original picture of the unit. And when you got here? Well, when, even when I got here, you know, it took a few months in order for me to see. Just that it was genuine, you know. Mm. Because there was five years here at that time, you know, and it was, everyone else had the same suspicions, you know. We thought the place was bugged. We thought there was... Um, they were waiting with big injections, you know, to dope us up every two minutes, but, you know, it never turned out like that. Have you been surprised at how well things have gone here? I mean, there does seem to be some sort of relationship between yourselves and, and the officers here. 
yeah, well, no doubt about it. Well, when you consider that um, I'm now very close to some of the stuff in here, whereas the seven years previous to that, I'd hardly spoken to any warder. Was this really just clutching at a straw at the last hope? More There's no this? doubt about it, you know, because <clears throat> when you consider that I'd just come from a cage. In Inverness. In Inverness prison, and I'd been kept there for four and a half years. I had nothing. Any food was thrown under the cage. There was no talk or dialogue between me and any of the prison people there. And to be thrown into this situation, you know, it offered me something, whereas the cage existence, I became so alien to the outside world, it became so alien to me that it was hard to understand that there was a world outside. Well, I arrived at the station and I, I was handed over by two Peterhead prison officers, you know, taking out the handcuffs and handed it over. And I go into the van <coughs> and the officer put his hand forward and says, uh, my name is Gus, you know, pleased to meet you. And this really, to me, was really shattering, you know. And he says, this is... You know, I couldn't have taken in, I thought this was a big con, you know, I said, this isn't real, you know. These guys don't feel this way about me, you know. And then when I got up here, Jimmy and Larry and Ben met me, you know. And the free atmosphere, they were in their own clothes, and uh, when I came in through the door, that when you usually come into prison, you come into a reception and they strip you down, they search you, look through your body with instruments, and uh, when I came in here, this is a... Uh, I'm going to get a coffee and talk to the boys and you can come down and check your gear later, you know. And they were walking about calling officers with their first name and the officers were calling them with their first name. I was beginning to wonder what kind of place I'd go into, you know. If it was a place for human and nuts or something, you know. I was wondering if they were on drugs to tell you the truth, you know? Because to see Larry and, and Jimmy this way, you know, it was a real shock to me. Yeah, well, I heard I was coming here just after the... Let me see, two months after a riot at Inverness, you know, I was lying in the solitary and two officers came up from here and told me I was being selected for a special unit. So I says, aye, aye, <laughs> same thing as Inverness, you know, or maybe some sort of funny farm, you know, you know, they were giving us out. So I came down here and I says, there's no bars, there's no cages, there's no straight jackets that I can see, you know, so there must be a catch. So I've been fishing about, and to be honest, I still can't see the catch, you know. When you were at this cementing stage of it, cementing the relationship here, uh, you yourself were going to attack another prison officer, weren't you? Yeah, well, that was really a long time ago. Mm -hmm. That was uh, before I went to trial in Vernes, and I had a beard then, you know. So. Uh, Went in and I took the clippers, you know, I was taking my beard off and this officer came in and he pulled the clippers away. He says, you can't take a beard off without permission. And this was half past six in the morning, you know. And I was never at my best at half past six in the morning and this was about um, a fortnight after I came here, this was. So I just grabbed him by the throat and pushed him against the wall and then there was actually two inmates that had come down with me from Inverness that separated us, you know. You had scissors in your hands. What were yeah. you going to do? Well, I wasn't going to do any of the scissors. The scissors were only part of the cutting the beard off, you know. I think the officer probably saw me with this because I had the grip him with the throat and I had the scissors in my hand. No doubt the relation of me and a pointed weapon and grabbing him by the throat made him think that, that he was intended to be stabbed. But I never consciously or, as far as I know, unconsciously formed any intention of stabbing him, you know. Well, despite what you say about not hurting them, the officer involved in the assault said that if it had taken place in a normal prison setting, that he wouldn't be alive today. Well, uh, yeah, I think he may be over-dramatising the situation to say that he'd be dead. Now, you can't possibly say that, can you? But uh, in a normal prison setting, he would have got injured, yes. How? Because Why? it would have escalated, you know. In normal prison, things don't just drop there and de-escalate. If you grab a prison officer, he takes out his truncheon and then you can apologise if you like, you get hit with that truncheon, you know? Yeah, well, I was in another part of the 
unit and somebody come running around for me and says Larry's acting up. So when I went round there they were all there and there was a struggle, you know, and I immediately jumped in. You know, and Larry had his scissors in his hand and I just take, took them from him, you know. But I don't think Larry, Larry was going to use these scissors, you know. I, it just so happened he had them because it was a beard and haircut situation and um, obviously that made it look worse for the staff point of view considering Larry and my reputation but you know okay I, d I did step in simply because at that time I seen just what this place was all about you know in fact I think that was maybe a good thing that, that happened because it really after that it stabilized the place it let us see because at that point no staff pulled out their buttons and started hitting everybody in sight what they do in every other place they were trying to um, pacify the situation and we did the same. Everybody acted very responsibly and Larry after it recognised the folly of the thing, you know. To me, the way I reacted to that is because I think this was my last straw. I knew that if this place didn't come, I would be as well dead, I'd be as well. I was finished completely because there was nothing else for me. And if I couldn't accept this, then that was it, you know. And it's a hell of a lot to throw away when you're last. People don't throw their life away like that, you know. We suddenly took no action against them. That was left to the unit to deal with. Our reaction was that the unit was achieving something because I'm quite sure that before he had been in the unit, he wouldn't have stopped at threatening. He would have carried out the threat. But if someone had attacked an officer in the same way in an ordinary prison setting, uh, he would have been punished for it. Yes, he would have been punished more formally. I think uh, Larry was punished uh, much more uh, personally to him, made feel much more responsible. He, uh, he saw, I think started to see then his responsibility for his part of the unit. Everyone shares a strong interest in making the unit work. But there are additional unseen pressures on the prisoners during their term here compared to normal prison life. Misbehaviour in another jail would bring punishment on your own head. But here, violence could jeopardise the whole unit and lead to its being closed down. If that happened, a prisoner would lose what he sees as the last chance of a reasonable life in the years ahead. So would his mates. This has led to prisoners being more responsible. But this change of attitude is just as profound for the staff, who are all volunteers. Well, of course, I think in terms of direct relationships, this is something that, uh, you know, I suppose you could apply it to your ordinary, everyday relationships you build up anywhere, despite the fact that, you know, we're dealing with people who are in prison. And the theory and the practice that we've worked in here is to respond or develop a relationship with prisoners in exactly the same terms as we would uh, develop relationships with people outside. You know, after the initial apprehensions, there must still have been fears, anxiety, suspicions on either side. I mean, even although you, you once, once you got used to each other, how were those eliminated? They were eliminated purely by trust in both, both ways. The, the more resp if you give responsibility to people, they accept the responsibility. And by giving responsibility, then you build up trust. If they accept that responsibility and live up to it, and the trust comes across the other way, and it's a two-way thing, ongoing the whole time throughout the whole concept of the unit since ever it's been started. And trust and responsibility has been increased. The prison service tends to take away all the responsibility from a prisoner, tells him when to get up, when to eat, when to go to work, even when he can have his recreation. What the unit has been doing is be putting the responsibility back to the prisoner, making him responsible for his own programme and for carrying it out. When I get up at six o'clock in the morning, I cook the boys a breakfast, I make a lunch, tea, and I go out in the shop for messages. I don't, if we need anything special, I'll go out. We've only got about two pounds to spend on food, so it's just to supplement your, your diet, you know, sausage and curries and things like that. You can't buy meats or anything like that. Just some vegetables. I think they quite enjoy it because the main point is uh, you can eat when you're hungry and they get it hot and that's a big improvement, you know? Yeah. Well, I think the philosophy of this place is obvious, you know? 
because they, they've tried the other system for so long and it's never worked. I think this is the obvious way, if you, and it's the best way of assessing a man. If you've got a situation like this where, where you're, you get to know people, I was up in Peterhead for nine years, and in nine years no officer could possibly say he knows me. I know these guys aren't going to take a chance and make out a good report, why should they? Because I could, uh, they think I could go out and do something, and if they made out a good report it falls back on them. But in a situation like this, the officers get to know me, and you can't possibly wear a mask like you can do in other systems. You can't possibly wear a mask for 24 hours a day when you're sitting talking to a guy every day and you're living with him. The men here in the nine months that I've been here know me far, far better than anybody up at Peterhead did in the nine years I was up there. Had you found that you'd missed anything in particular? Yes, I'd, uh, you miss feminine company. Not only uh, the sex thing, uh, the softness of women. In, in prison, you've got to wear a mask, a shell, you know, you, you portray yourself as a, a sort of hard man sort of image, and you've got to keep it up, and you can't break down and be soft and, and, and be your natural self like you can when, when you're speaking to, to women and outside people, you know? And it was great to, to throw off the mask and, and be your natural self. Ian, some people might think that you have it fairly easy in the special unit. Well, I can definitely say that these kind of people want to come in and try and do their time in here because we definitely haven't got it easy. We've got certain advantages in this jail, like some of my budgies. I've got a record player. I get out to see my dad. That gives me hope. But it also, the staff, that is how they're gaining us. They're gaining us hope. That way we can't get into trouble after getting these kind of things. We kind of get into trouble, say the lights are getting sent back to another jail. This could never happen, because we'd lose all the privileges. That's how I'd never get into trouble in uh, my life again. It's because I'm in the unit after having received the budgies, never else. That's the only things that would give me, budgies and seeing my dad. So really from being in a position where you had nothing to lose, you've now got, in prison terms, quite a lot to lose. I've got a very lot to lose, yes. My father, my budgies had already said, yes. It has to work, because it all gives us hope, the likes of Jimmy, Larry, and even myself. We never thought we'd see freedom, but now we do know that we'll get out someday. I go once a month to see my father in a dressing, who's 86 years of age. You, you say that you get out officially once a month, but there are other occasions too when you when you get out, aren't there? Uh, certain occasions. If I want to buy new budgies or go to a budgie show, I get out. How often would that be? It depends on the staff. We have a community meeting and ask them. There is a certain opinion outside, and I'm sure you're aware of it, that people in this unit really shouldn't get out at all, that they might well be a danger to the public. Oh, they're definitely wrong there. Definitely. Well, if I was one of those persons, how would you assure me that I was wrong? I'd have to bring you into the unit to see the guys before you'd believe it. Definitely none of us want any trouble. We're all getting on ahead with our work and we want to see freedom. What now are your thoughts about the incident that brought you here, the, the murder? It's worse now, at night. I feel sad and I feel lonely, I feel angry at committing the murder. It's just stupid, looking back on it. Now that I've got hope, I don't feel like going back home, not to live, because I did the murder at home. I don't feel at all going back home, because of the person I killed. I miss her. She's the only girl in my life, and I lie and think about it every night. And I think most murderers, it's committed a murder at prison in mind. A lot, although a lot of them will tell you different. Ian, you go up before the parole board in a few months' time now. Yeah. What sort of hope do you have of them approving of your parole and of you eventually being released? I've no hope of getting parole. I go up in April in the parole board, but I've no hope. I've no hope for the next five years. I'll have to do 12 years before I've got hope. I know that. No hope whatsoever of me getting parole for five years. 
You've been in for 14 years now, Rab. You go up before the parole board in just a few weeks from now. How hopeful are you of parole this time? Well, uh, I've already been knocked back once here, and that was after I was here a year. And I've got, I've got a lot of hope, and they've given me a lot of hope by what they've done, the officers and staff and that, all the inmates. They've helped me a great deal, and uh, as I say, it, it wouldn't make any difference to me. The only difference it'll make is if I don't get it. What sort of work have you been doing outside? Well, I've been doing a bit of help to build a stage in the Citizens Theatre there and moving a lot of the scenery and all this, you know. I've been doing a bit of painting, which has been my job all my through my sentence. And I've made a lot of toys in that, you know. Yeah. What would you say, Ram, to the, the people who condemn this type of treatment for uh, people who've been convicted of, of killing and, and people who have shown violent tendencies in prison? Well, these people don't understand what we, what most Aussies went through. And to realise what they're talking about, they would have to be in jail. You know, this is all I can say. They would have to be in prison or so, even for a week, to understand what we go through, you know. Even for what we've done. Well, it's 14 years for what I've done. And it's as far as I'm concerned, it's just uh, too much, you know. They're just, they're, they're making me... A prisoner that's got no hope, no chance in any other system but this one. Mm. Of course, you were convicted of, of, of murder, of stabbing uh, another youth. Yeah. Uh, do you ever look back on that with any sorrow now? You, you always look back in sorrow because as, you, as I've grown up, which has taken a long while, but when I did, you realise that it has been very wrong, you know, and you know that you know there's no chance of you doing it again. No. Well, how certain are you there's no chance of you ever doing something well, like that again? Because I'll walk away for any trouble now, which I have done, you know, in paroles and this. You just walk away for these sort of things because you can't afford to be in this situation because you know you're going to come back and do another 14 years and this is something nobody wants in the prisons. You know? What 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 I done? The fights that I get with people and slash people and things like that. They could have, they. I mean, they they were capable and did do the same thing to me. You know, and it was this sort of jungle existence, this acceptable jungle existence amongst each other, the environment. You know, it was perfectly acceptable. You know, but again, I must say that I now see it as being futile, and I now see it as I'm doing something that I never dreamt I'd ever be doing now. You talk about the jungle existence. Many people say that dangerous animals should be locked up forever. Just so long as they're dangerous, you know. But, you know, what do you do? I mean, they turn around and say, OK, that's that guy, he's, he's done this, keep him away, put him away for life. Well, I mean, if you think about that, put a person away for life, who's going to open them up? Who's going to um, start keeping them there for life? Especially the treatment as it is in prisons where it's solely degradation and humiliation. I mean, a guy's going to be more of an animal and react more of an animal and under that treatment, and that's what happens here. You know, I say that um, in, my, in my own case, I feel like I've got something positive. I think that people should use that. I'd like a chance to maybe speak to kids in Boston, and not in an evangelistical sense, but, you know, just what it's all about, you know, the futility the life I read, because what you've got to remember is there's kids in my district and kids in Boston's young offenders look up to me simply because I'm supposed to be this wild man and the reputation, you know. So I would like to sort of help them, you know, try to let them see, you know, the true situation. There's nothing nice about coming in to spend the rest of your life in prison. Nothing nice at all. You know, there's nothing glamorous about it. You know. I have to... Um, Love them experiences. For Christ's sake, I don't want any other kid um, having the experience, especially my own son. And that's how I'd like to try and guide him. That's what this place allows me to do. Get, sort of guide him in some sense. And in, in the hope that this can also affect some of his pals or any other kids that go out to prevent them from coming into the, the criminal life. You know, hopefully this is what I would do. But certainly there's sorrow, you know, there's... I feel that, you know, why does it, what, what alternative, why should we have these um, situations, you know?
and that's why I'm doing this um, open university thing, simply because I have to work at getting the qualifications in order for to try and help the situation, because nobody will touch me if you've not got the qualifications, being the sort of person I am. From the tough Gorbals background, where his name was often feared, Jimmy is not only studying for an open university degree, but has made a name for himself in another direction, as a sculptor. I can still remember his laughing at it when Joyce Lane, an art therapist, came in with seven pound of clay, just for the five years in here and put it down, just for fun. And um, from there, you know, we're messing about with it. And from there, I created two pieces. And when she came back a fortnight later, she seen probably a latent talent brought to the surface. And she made some noise and got the materials and for there it's right on. And to me it's really um, wonderful because here I'm doing something in a creative sense. After all this destruction, here's this creation coming out, you know. What sense of satisfaction does it give you to be able to create rather than destroy? And exp I think I express myself um, very strongly in the work that I create, you know. Because during these past seven years in prison, I've never been allowed to express myself. I can't afford to have an off day. I can't afford to um, be upset because prison rules don't allow it. You know, and I feel I'm getting all my emotions, all my feelings out in my sculpture. Even your aggression, perhaps? Even my aggression. Everything's been channeled in, into it. You know, when I get some of the best times for me to work is when I'm angry or frustrated. And, you know, I just pour the, probably the hate and frustrations into the work that I'm creating. You had a very successful exhibition at Edinburgh Festival. What was your sort of reaction your first time out of prison after seven and a half, eight years? Well, it was really very strong, you know. It was... What you've got to remember, 18 months ago, no future in this cage, and now, walking along the street. I mean, people... I mean, I was looking at people's faces. I was looking at... It was, you know, it was amazing. I went into a shop, run all over the shop, looking, just drinking and everything in my eyes. My eyes were so thirsty for normal human actions. What people do, walking along with a shopping bag, women with kids in the pram, to, to see this, you know, was really, it was overwhelming. It was a very emotional thing, you know, and it was wonderful, really f fantastic, because this was, I never thought I'd have this again. I never thought I'd walk a street. To me, to touch a pavement, you know, and to feel like glass window, these were things that mad. And also to buy something over a counter, you know. Okay, people would take all that for granted, but for Christ's sake, if only they knew what it meant to me, you know. To me it was tremendous. I went into my exhibition. As I went in, the BBC were there. And, you know, one thing that Prisons Department abhor is publicity for any parolees. So I took fright and ran into a toilet <laughs> and locked myself in and the two prison staff were away and we stood outside so I was locked in a loo for the first hour of freedom <laughs> um, till such times as the BBC left. And Jimmy's outing to the Edinburgh Festival was criticised by some newspapers. The same happened when he recently went into hospital and when Ian was allowed to visit his home one weekend. Although the press have been inside the unit, some staff and prisoners are still resentful of what they see as a lack of understanding sometimes spiced with sensationalism, a topic that was discussed at a unit meeting. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't, uh, people shouldn't know what's happening. The press wasn't, uh, wasn't very good, but then it wasn't very bad. We've had worse press. I've certainly come down in Jimmy Boyle, you know, but there's four other, um, three other inmates in this unit get out. And no, nothing was done about them. Nobody came in heavy against them. You know, I'm just one of many, you know, and it's been um, okay that I'm getting out, but that doesn't mean that I'm getting out um, tomorrow free. I've got a hell of a long time to do. Okay, but I'm still getting contact with the outside world. But okay, press is, press is there. 
I, mean, I can see the press um, letting the, the public know, but I don't see that it should stop progress in the case. I don't see it should detract or stop Maverick now, and I hope that's not the case. If I was in an ordinary prison, I'd be getting out anyway, in the length of time I've been in. I was in a training situation in an ordinary prison, so I don't see the press has got any kick with me. People are failing to understand what we're trying to do here. The fact that I'm going to, that's the only way this unit will be tested, and as to how we react to, to, to the um, press. Certainly we, we don't like it, but to a large extent, I must say, we've all been rather philosophical about it, and say as well, OK, this is, the, this is the problem we've got. We've got to get it over, and that's why you are in here today. You know, but OK, you're in here as a reporter. What do you see, see the situation? You, you're a member of society. What do you see? You're a member of the public. You're in here as a rep representative of the public. What is your um, feelings on it? On the publicity? Yeah. Well, I think as a journalist that uh, they were quite right in reporting it. But I th what, what I find uh, surprising is that the press having been in here, that there's still uh, a certain amount of sensationalism attached to the visit, which is why I ask again the question, you know, has this unit failed to get across to the public what it's doing? No, no I, well, I don't accept so. that. I think, I, no, I think you've got to, as a journalist, accept some of the stick of um, bad journalism. You know, I think we have behaved very responsible the, towards the press. We brought them in, we showed them. Now, all we were asking for was objective um, reporting. We didn't want reporting which would build us up or re reporting that would smash us down. We wanted straight, objective reporting that would get the facts across to the public of what we were doing in here. Uh, I think we got that in our first press coverage. Um, but on this particular article about Jimmy, um, I think there was the old sensationalism that was coming in. Oh, this is a great story, you know, let's spread it, you know. Um, a great outrage was caused by James Boyle going, etc., etc., etc. What outrage? By whom? You know, it, it failed to stay who was outraged. Um, I think the press has got to grow up a lot on, when it comes to prisons. Um, prisons are great. Bad, bad news stories. They always have been. But the press has really got to sort of grow up in this respect and sort of take objective views of what's going on inside prisons today. Uh, but what the public, I think, has got to realise and what journalism has got to realise, that we in here are responsible people. People dislike what happens in here, fair enough. Um, people like what happens in here, fair enough. And the broad consensus of... Um, prison staff, I think, are somewhere between the two extremes. You know, they want to be able to make a balanced judgment. We're still very much an experiment. We will be an experiment for a long time to come. He went out and uh, went through there to Edinburgh with two members of staff, saw the exhibition, his own one and others, and came back. Yeah. This is what it's all about. This is what gets me, you know. It's all this sensational stuff, but nobody ever takes the positive side of it. The fact is, I did act responsibly through there. You know, nobody's willing to give people that sort of credit. All they want to do is put people down. Put, we can all go on putting people down, but that's not what it's all about. No one here. Any decision that came to take me out was made maturely and very responsibly. And that, that is proved by the fact that I'm sitting here, by the community in here. We don't just say, OK, let's take Jim out and that's it. In here, we really um, discuss it. And at the end of the day, after much conversation, much... We had to fight a hell of a lot to get it. But at the same time, it did come, and the department come with us. And the result is... We've, we've, we've proven ourselves correct in any decision we've made this correct. You know, all we ask for people today is to try and understand what we're trying to do. We're doing something here It's a hell of a lot more positive than any, anything else that I've ever seen in the penal system. And all we're saying is try and bear ways and see what we're doing. It's the best thing that's ever happened in Scottish prisons. Not just here. Right. You know? Because Jimmy is supposed to be one of the most violent prisoners. Now he can be taken out, escorted to an Edinburgh festival. Now I think that must give the fellas up in Peterhead and other prisons a bit of hope. This unit's um, given me some hope. By saying that, I don't mean that I'm going to be out in five years' time or out in ten years' time. I mean that there's hope at the end of the tunnel now, you know, whereas before. Um, what you, is it, I can, so you have to go back, keep going back to the, the situation that the intensity of the last six years was tremendous and it was hard for me to um, 
when I look back now, I say to myself, how the hell didn't I go insane then? But fortunately I've come out of it, you know, and this place has offered an alternative, you know, something even my own district didn't offer. This has offered me an alternative, it's shown me a different way of life, and it's, it's really made, it's really created new energy within me, new drive, only in a positive way, rather than the negative sense. You have to be very, very realistic here, and uh, view each sentence as it comes up. Now, if, if the life sentence does the average of somewhere between 10 and 15 years, and then I, I do the rest, it means I do something like 20 odd years inside. Right? Which makes me come out like maybe when I'm 46 or something. But there's so many ifs and, and buts in this case that uh, I really don't see any possibility of getting out. You know? Well, what sort of life will you make for yourself in here? Well, I'll just do what I'm doing now. Uh, I'll read a lot. I'm trying my hand at a uh, writing a couple of things, you know, short stories and a novel, you know. I just... I try not to get institutionalised, you know. Do you feel that society has any right, really, to lock someone away for the rest of his life until he dies? Well... That depends entirely on both the society and the individual. In your case? In my case, I'm completely biased, you know. So I couldn't give you a very objective answer. I could say, yes, society could let me out and I wouldn't do any harm. And I wouldn't do it any harm. But has society got the right to keep me in? I don't know. Do you hold out any hope whatsoever of ever being released before you die? None. It's no part of the prison service to destroy a man. And if we're going to keep a man inside for a very, very long time, I think we must take certain steps to preserve his dignity, to preserve his interest, to prevent him turning into a cabbage. And I think it's essential that he has some contact with the outside world. And if this is, this is properly ordered, one would see it continuing. Alec, could I just take you one at a time through him? JC, for instance, what is the situation with him now? Well, he's made remarkable progress since he's come into the unit and he's currently being considered um, by the parole system. This, of course, in itself is no indication that release is anywhere near, but at least, you know, there is hope. One cannot put it higher than that. How about Rab? Here again, uh, he has made some progress, more over the last few months than he had done, say, in his first year in the unit. Again, this is another case in which one can see hope. And Ian? This is an extremely difficult case to answer. Certainly he has, so far as he is able, participated in the working of the unit. He has become very slowly and very gradually a part of the community. But there are very many difficulties where he is concerned. Jimmy? Complex one. His history doesn't help him in any way. One can only say that one cannot see release for him for a very long time indeed without trying to put any term on it. How about Larry? I suppose, as he says himself, the most hopeless case of all.